name is David Kenny, and we're glad to have Terry Jones with us. Terry's been with us all week, and he's uh, been doing a series of lessons at the Wadsworth Church of Christ in a series that's been called One on One with Jesus. And he, we've been, we're so thankful that he's been willing to come into the studio and record these lessons here as well. He's gotten up to come in early on three different days to record these lessons so that we could share them with you. And we're so thankful for him. This is his seventh and final lesson, One on One with Jesus, Jesus and the Lame Man. Terry, thanks again. Thank you, David. It has truly been a joy and a privilege for me to have been a part of uh, the program this week. I have enjoyed uh, in the gospel meeting with the local church here and having the invitation to come and to be a part of this program has been just a tremendous joy for me. And We appreciate so much you tuning into the program and we invite you to tune in at every opportunity that you can and every time that it airs. And we are truly thankful to have the opportunity to uh, look at this theme one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and we hope that it is a study that's been profitable to you and we hope that we can share some things with you again today that will help you in your study of the Word of God. Today we'd like to direct your attention to the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John and here we uh, notice that the Bible tells us about an occasion where Jesus healed a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And so it uh, may be one of those passages that you've read many times, maybe that you remember well. And we'd invite you uh, to join in with our study of that passage today. You know, Jesus had a way of changing lives. There was never, ever a person who ever came into contact with Jesus whose life was not affected, impacted, and changed forever. Think about that Samaritan woman that Jesus spoke to at the well. Her life was never the same after she talked with Jesus. Think about Zacchaeus as he was up in that sycamore tree. He wanted to see Jesus and he had the opportunity not only to see Jesus, but Jesus went to his ha house and brought salvation to him that day. His life was never the same. And on and on we could go of those who came into contact with Jesus, their life would never be the same after that. Today we want to look at a man whose life was uh, changed forever after he met Jesus. It was a man who was a lame man that Jesus healed. Well, as we turn our attention to John chapter 5, I'd like for us to notice that Jesus performs a miracle on this lame man. He heals him. But let's notice what the Bible says concerning the circumstances of that miracle. In verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, Now there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind and lamed and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For the angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease that he had. Now, we notice here the circumstances of this miracle. It's interesting here that the Bible tells us about the period of time in which this miracle occurred. Verse 1 says that it was during the time of the feast of the Jews that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Well, this uh, here is one of the feasts of the Jews and we know that they had a variety of annual feasts that they observed and it's not really uh, we're not really able to determine for sure what uh, particular feast this was. However, I think that most scholars lean toward this being during the time of the Passover. And Jesus has made his way to Jerusalem to observe this feast and likely it was the Passover. Notice the presence of Jesus here. The Bible says that he came from Galilee uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, you know, Jesus put forth considerable effort here to be in Jerusalem at the time of this feast. You know, I believe that this is a lesson that we could learn about spiritual priority and the sacrifice that is involved in putting spiritual matters first. 
You know, attending a feast at Jerusalem was not an easy thing for many folks. It was something that took a great deal of time. It took a great deal of effort. They would have had to have traveled sometimes a long way. Sometimes they traveled for days to get to Jerusalem on those old, dusty, bumpy, rocky roads to get there so that they might observe those feasts. Jesus did that. Why did they do that? Because it was a priority in their life. That's what was expected of them. That's what God had commanded of them. And that's what they did. And Jesus did that. Too many folks want a convenient religion that requires no sacrifice or an inconvenience at any time. You know, it's hard for us to get people to come to, to air-conditioned buildings and sit on padded pews and all of the wonderful luxury and comforts that we have in our church buildings today. And still, there's a lot of people that just can't seem to get their priorities straight and to put spiritual matters first in their life. Jesus came to Jerusalem. In verse 2, we see that the Bible tells us that there was a pool there in Jerusalem. Uh, we learn several things about this pool. Notice, first of all, it tells about the place of the pool. This pool was located near the northeast corner of the wall around Jerusalem. It's through this gate that sheep were brought to the sacrifices at the nearby temple. And so when they made these sacrifices, the sheep were brought through this gate. And it was there that we find this pool. But then notice the pity in that pool. The Bible here says that it was called in Hebrew, Bethesda. Now the name Bethesda means house of pity or mercy. Uh, it was called that on account of its strong healing properties and the property of uh, restoring health to the sick and those who were infirmed. Well, this pool located near the Sheep Gate ought to remind us of the, uh, of the mercy of God in providing the lamb as a sacrifice for our sin. You remember John 1, 29? John the Baptist pointing to Jesus in the distance, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's what Jesus was. And so we're reminded of that on this occasion. But then notice here that the Bible tells us about some porches that were there at the pool. The Bible says that, that this pool had five porches. Now, Ryle made this observation. He said, and I quote, These porches were probably covered arcades, piazzas, colonnades, or verandas, open at one end to the air, but protected against the sun or rain overhead. Lock your ads. The five porches mentioned were provided to accommodate the invalids who desired to use the waters. And I think that those are pretty good observations here. So in these porches, the sick could find needed shelter as they gathered around the pool waiting for help to come from the pool. And so while they were there, they were sheltered from the sun and the rain and other elements that might provide for them some comfort. But then let us notice also that the Bible here tells us something about the people that were around the pool. The Bible says that there were people laying around this pool. What kind of people were they? They were sick, and they were blind, and they were lame, and they were paralyzed. You know, Jesus often found himself in the midst of those who were ill. Matthew 15, verses 30 and 31 tells us about occasion where there were many that were brought to Jesus that were sick and lame and blind. And the Bible says that Jesus healed them. It's interesting to me that when Jesus came to Jerusalem, He came to this place. He came to this pool. Why? Because there were people there that were sick. There were people there that had needs. But I believe that Jesus came to this pool with this man in mind that here's a man that Jesus wanted to help. Then notice the crowd of people here. The Bible tells us that the people around the pool needing help formed a great multitude. It wasn't just a few people who were in need. There were many people. They were sick and they were in need of help. And so we see that it is a multitude that is gathered there. Well, 
notice the concern of the people. The people were waiting for the moving of the water, verse 3 tells us. The primary concern of the people was the stirring up of the water and their effort to get into it to be healed. The idea was, is that if you could be the first one in the water, as it was being stirred, that you would be healed of whatever malady that you may have. Now, here's a people that weren't concerned about ordinary things that we often are concerned about. You know, these people at this pool, they weren't concerned about the weather. They had no concern for politics. They weren't concerned about business. They weren't concerned about money or fame or fortune or any of those things. They were sick. And they needed very desperately to be healed. You know, the primary concern of every sinner ought to be the receiving of salvation. Sometimes people get so busy in life going here and there and yonder and taking care of life and circumstances in life that they neglect the most important thing and that is the salvation of their soul. And yet Jesus said in Matthew 11 beginning in verse 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Let's not forget to come to Jesus that we might find salvation for our soul. And so we notice here the circumstance of this miracle. But then in the second place, let us notice the crippled man in the miracle. In verses 5 through 7, there the Bible says, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Notice here the problem of this man. In verse 5, we see that this man has a lame problem. The verse says that he has an infirmity. This infirmity had left him crippled. He couldn't walk. You know, in Luke chapter 13 and verse 11, there the Bible tells us about a woman who had an infirmity and as such, she was stooped over. She was all drawn up and bent over so that she couldn't straighten up. And she had that condition for 18 years. And Jesus healed her. Well, here we find that there's a man that has a very similar thing. He has an infirmity, and his body is all drawn up, even to the point that he no longer could walk or to take care of himself and so this is the reason that he is lying by this pool. This infirmity caused this man to be helpless. He could not walk and therefore he needed assistance from others to move about. And so it kept him from being able to be the first one in the pool because he couldn't motivate himself. Then there were always those that were stepping in front of him and getting in the pool before him. So we see that this man had a lame problem, but he also had a long problem. He had had this infirmity for 38 years. He had suffered terribly. And the length of this infirmity indicates that it was beyond the ability of physicians to cure. And he truly was a helpless case. Well then, in verse 6, we go on to notice not only the problem of the man, but let's notice the pity for the man. Here we see that Jesus saw the man, Jesus sympathized with the man, and then Jesus spoke to the man. Well, Jesus saw this man. How did he see him? There was a multitude there. Why did, and how did Jesus see this man? Well, I believe he saw this man the same way he saw Zacchaeus up there in that sycamore tree in Luke chapter 19. I believe that he saw this man in the same way that he saw that woman who had an issue of blood in Luke chapter 8. You remember? She had that issue of blood for some 12 years. She'd spent everything that she had on doctors trying to be cured, 
but she felt that if she could just get close enough to Jesus, even to just touch the hem of His garment, that she might be healed. And so she did. And with the last bit of energy that she had, she fought her way through that crowd, and she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and lo and behold, she was healed. But then what happened? Jesus turned and He said, Who touched me? The disciples said, Lord, man, there are people hanging all over you. There are multitudes around you and they're touching you and hanging on to you. And you say, Who touched me? He said, Somebody touched me. I felt the power. You see, the power went from Him to heal the woman. And she confessed that she was the one that touched Him. How did He know that? You see, Jesus knows everything. There's nothing He doesn't know. He knew that woman was coming. He knew Zacchaeus was in the tree. And He knew that this lame man was by the pool of Bethesda and He needed help. And so Jesus sympathized with this man. He knew that He already had been in that condition a long time. And Jesus wanted to help. So we notice that Jesus begins by speaking to this man. And He says, to him, do you want to be made well? Well, this question begins the process of moving this man's focus from illness to wellness. It moves this man's focus from helplessness to hopefulness. But then in verse 7, notice, if you will, the plight of this man. Here we notice the heartlessness of his plight, the hopelessness of his plight, and the honesty about his plight. You see, it was heartlessness that we find here. This man had no help. He said to the Lord, Yeah, I want to be healed, but I can't get in the pool because there are others that step in front of me. Maybe they were stepping over him. You know, it's a sad commentary on his fellow man that someone wouldn't assist him in getting into that pool. Isn't that sad? In Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 10, the Bible tells us, As you have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Here's a man that needed a good Samaritan. Here's a man that needed a good neighbor. Someone that would take interest in him and out of the kindness of their heart help him into the pool. But look at the hopelessness of his plight. Without the help of others, he was a hopeless case and he could not make it into the pool before others. Well, the one thing that we find here is the honesty on his part. He was honest about the circumstance that he was in. And so he says to Jesus, I can't get in the pool because there are others that are stepping over me and I can't get there. You know, if you don't tell the doctor the, your symptoms, is the doctor ever going to be able to help you with whatever malady that you might have? Now we've got to be honest with the doctor. We've got to tell him everything about our symptoms so that he can help. And likewise, we must be honest about our spiritual condition as we confess our sins to God. But then in the third place, in verses 8 and 9, let's notice the cure in this miracle. Notice the cure here. Verses 8 and 9 says, Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. You know, it's interesting here, not so much what we find, but what we don't find. Look at the omission in this cure. What's missing? Well, what's missing is the use of the pool. Jesus didn't say, here, let me help you into the pool. What He said was, we don't need the pool. <laughs> in essence, He is saying, the pool is not necessary. And so what does Jesus say? He says, arise and take up your bed and walk. There's the orders for the cure. Jesus commands this man to do three things. There's the rising, there's the taking, and the walking. He said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But then let us notice the obedience in the cure. Verse 9. What did the man do? The Bible says immediately the man was made well, he took up his bed, and he walked. Look at the faith in his obedience. You see, up to this point, we don't have any indication that this man believed in Jesus or had faith in Jesus. 
But you know what? When Jesus commanded him to rise, take up his bed, and walk, we see the first occasion, the first evidence of his faith. He did what Jesus said do. The Bible says that he did that. Look at the fastness of this obedience. The Bible says immediately the man was made well, he took up his bed and walked. The fastness of his healing and the fastness of his obedience went hand in hand. His healing was immediate and so was his obedience. But look at the fullness of his obedience. Jesus commanded this man, arise, take up your bed, and walk. And that's exactly what he did. You know, it's interesting to me that for the first time in 38 years, this man walked. He was just at the pool with his back on his bed, and now he's walking with his bed on his back. That's what happens when you obey Jesus. Good things happen. This man was healed physically. We can be healed spiritually if we'll just simply do what Jesus said do. We thank you for tuning in to our program today, and we invite you to tune in once again. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there that people follow. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They follow things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Some attempt to change the order of the turns. Maybe they be, might be baptized before they even believe. Some fail to realize what point they are even on the map. They don't even look at the map, thinking that they're saved already and haven't even opened their Bibles yet. As a person is traveling in a car must follow the road map's directions, or a hiker, as shown here, must follow the trail map, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's consider the first intersection on our road map, believe God's word or to have faith. We must have faith, which comes from God's Word, Romans 10, 17. Hebrews 11, 6 states that we cannot please God without faith. It states, but without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Jesus stated this, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. Our next intersection is repent. Repentance requires a change. We must bring our life in conformity to the way God would have us to be. The Jews who crucified Christ were commanded to repent. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 Claiming ignorance will not work. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30 Our next intersection is confess. A person must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. To confess this means one acknowledges both his humanity and his divinity. We must confess, as it says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10.10 .10. If you want Jesus to confess you to the Father, then you must confess Jesus before men. Matthew wrote, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32. The next turn on our map is immersion. Baptism is perhaps the most controversial step in the plan of salvation to some people. However, the New Testament is clear that one has to be immersed in water to obtain salvation. Notice that faith precedes, not negates, baptism. Mark wrote, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Baptism is immersion which pictures a burial. Paul wrote, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We put Christ on when we are baptized. Galatians 3.27 states, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And some people try to say, well, baptism doesn't save us. But the Bible is very clear about that. Baptism clearly saves us. 
quote, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 3.21. Don't let anyone try to persuade you otherwise. Read the New Testament and see it for yourself. Baptism is required to be added to the church, in which is the only place salvation can be found. At this point, we've reached our final intersection on our road map, the church. One is not voted into the church after some religious testimony. The Lord adds him to the church. Notice in Acts 2.47, it reads, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Once one is added to the church, they are a Christian. A Christian means like Christ. This means we follow Christ's teaching and example, both in our words and in our deeds. We then must live a Christian life regardless of the consequences. We must remain faithful in the church until the Lord returns and takes his redeemed ones to heaven. We must be faithful Christian regardless of the consequences. Revelation 2.10 states, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Regardless of what Satan throws at us, we must remain faithful to Christ. Regardless of what governments may do to us, we must remain faithful to Christ and his word. We must remain faithful. So in review, let's take one more look at our roadmap to heaven and look at the steps along the way. Number one, believe. Number two, repent. Number three, confess. Number four, immersion or baptism. Number five, add it to the church and remain faithful. Friend, where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. If we can assist you with further information for your journey, please feel free to contact us.